Alive and Well STL is a presentation of the St. Louis Regional Health Commission and Rare Gem Productions to build a healthier St. Louis. Power up with the positive. Learn more at onerarejem.com. That's O-N-E-R-A-R-E-G-E-M.com. Support for Alive and Well STL comes from Beyond Housing. Helps entire communities become better places to live. Learn more at beyondhousing.org. The Regional Health Commission works in partnership with regional health sector advocates and stakeholders to improve health care access, reduce health disparities, and improve health outcomes for the uninsured and the underinsured in St. Louis City and County. Alive and Well, STL, with Bethany Johnson Javois, CEO of the St. Louis Integrated Health Network and Managing Director of the Ferguson Commission. On today's show, we share with you our celebration, our honor and privilege to sit at the feet of our elders. To be here, to be able to listen to their stories is powerful because in traditional cultures, the griot is the person who has the wisdom and passes the wisdom on to the younger people. And we need to cherish that tradition of passing on of wisdom in modern society. We'll be right back. Alive and well, STL. Washington Tabernacle Missionary Baptist Church welcomed Sister Mary Antona Ebo, Catholic nun and civil rights activist, as well as Frankie Muse Freeman Esquire, civil rights attorney, with facilitators Bethany Johnson Javois and Ronald Jackson. Bethany Johnson Javois, CEO of the St. Louis Integrated Health Network and managing director of the Ferguson Commission. Our host of Alive and Well welcomes Sister Mary Antona Ebo. Good evening. How good and how pleasant it is for brothers and sisters to dwell together in unity. And we know that time uh, got away from us because of the weather in February, but all things are appointed in due season. Amen? So this must be the due season for tonight's conversation, of which I am thrilled to be here with all of you tonight. Uh, I wanted to start off, I've been asked to do some background information on Sister Mary Antona Ebo that I'd like to share with you. How many are already familiar with Sister Ebo? <laughs> then what you know about her is the reading of this paper is really not her most favorite part of tonight. Am I right? Amen. She said amen. And yet, because she's worthy of all that we can say, I'm going to read close to every word about you because we really do need to hear again and again some of her good work. Okay. On Friday, May 8, 2009, Aquinas Institute of Theology in St. Louis conferred on Sister Antona Ebo the degree of Doctor of Humane Letters during its annual commencement ceremonies. She is known as a pioneer for civil rights. On Wednesday, March 10, 1965, she boarded a rickety airplane bound for Selma with Sister Eugene Marie Smith, four other white sisters and several clergymen to protest the vicious attack. They intended to join Reverend Martin Luther King's second attempt to cross Selma's Edmunds Pettus Bridge. Once there, the only African-American sister in the crowd, Sister Antona found herself thrust to the front of the march. Isn't that always happens that you're thrust to the front? Here, facing a bank of microphones, she spoke simply and from her heart, and now that is a classic quote from Sister Ebo that says, I am here because I am a Negro, a nun, a Catholic, and because I want to bear witness. All of her life, she has been a pioneer. She was the first African-American to graduate from her high school, Holy Trinity, in Bloomington, Illinois. She became one of the first three African-American women to join the Sisters of Mary, now called the Franciscan Sisters of Mary. In 1967, she became the first African-American woman executive director of a Catholic U.S. hospital, St. Clair Hospital in Baraboo, Wisconsin. That's still a hard feat today to be an executive of a hospital as a female, let alone African-American. And last thing, or two last things on here to read about her. In 1989, the National Black Sisters Conference conferred on her the Harriet Tubman Award, honoring her as called to be a Moses to the people. Amen. Amen. She has continued to speak out in her very young years of living. How You want to share your age? 90. 90 years. 91 next month. Praise the Lord. 
91 next month, and she continues to speak out, standing up for the dignity of African Americans, of women of all God's creatures, and others have listened. For many, she is the face of the civil rights movement, and she challenges listeners to live out the truth, as St. Francis did, that all God's creatures are equal in the eyes and in the heart of God. I present to you Sister Mary Antona Ebo. Okay, so what I want to do to start off um, is to ask a general question. The first question is, we just took some time to talk from your bio, the bullet points about your life. Sister Ebo, is there anything that you would like to share that's not on the paper? No. (laughs) And this is how we do it. I have a good job tonight. Okay, let, let me try it. Let me see if I can do number two. The second question that I would like to ask you is as you reflect on your life and your work, are there things that you would have done differently or maybe in a different order? I could not help but think as I was listening, there's just one thing that we ought to take time to do and that is to reflect on what do we hear Uh, there's so many times that we're all in such a hurry that we don't really reflect on God's greatness and goodness to each one of us because I noticed one of the questions there was who was your mentor and my mentor was the Holy Spirit my mother died when I was only four so it meant that I had to depend on somebody else. And when I didn't have that somebody else to depend upon, I think my mama, whom everybody else talked about, what a wonderful woman she was. It was almost like they learned some lines. And the lines were the Lord's Prayer. So you see, we need to take time to think about not only what Sister Ebo and Sister Freeman had done, but who led us to do what we have done, and then think about what we have done, y'all can do also. In your quote, you said, I am here because I am a Negro, a nun, a Catholic, and because I want to bear witness. And one that we know bears the best witness is the Holy Spirit. So I want to ask you, what was the call of the Holy Spirit to you as a young woman? And what do you hear the Holy Spirit saying now? The last part of your question is between the Holy Spirit and me. However, (laughs) before I start talking about myself, I might suggest that you read the biography of Sister Freeman. And there's one line in there that says the president came back to ask her if she belonged to any of those uh, different organizations that he may have to defend in front of the Congress. And she says she was so surprised at the question. She didn't know how to answer it. And she looked up at him and said, well, I'm a Baptist. (laughs) That is what being a witness means to me. It's being there and living what you talk. Amen. Thank you. (laughs) But that is what we are to call to do. And between the Holy Spirit and myself, it's up to me to draw nearer to the spiritual life that is before me and to do my best to make it alive not just something that we talk about. I think I've been able to do that, and I thank God for that blessing. You know the song we sing, been so busy praising my Jesus, ain't got time to die. Well, I've been so busy trying to live what I talk about that I don't have time to be doing anything other than just living it. And when it comes time to go home, I hope I have some credentials that will say, Okay, she pretty well did what she was trying to do. None of us will really come to that point where we think we've done it all. And and it's kind of like the old folks talking to the young folks and saying, you're all talking about you want a piece of the pie. Make your own daggum pie. (laughs) 
This is uh, the 50th anniversary of Selma that Sister Ebo attended 50 years ago. And uh, when Frankie came in, uh, she showed me a book, and it's called Racial Isolation in Public Schools. And it is uh, March 1967. So where are we, and how has the past influenced the now, from your perspective? I, I don't know how much time we spend on what was as we consider what is today and what could be around the corner from today because we're talking about spending our time walking the streets of Selma to convince ourselves and others that we have a right to register to vote. When we went down on March the 10th, and by the way, March the 10th is also the anniversary of the death of Harriet Tubman. And us six sisters used that day and walked the streets of Selma, reminding ourselves of the walk that was made by our ancestors out of slavery to freedom. We need to combine those two to connect the dots, to let people know that we know our own history, even if it isn't written in the books. Even if the books are so ragtagged and passed down to us after others have finished with them, we need to talk about the fact that we walk the streets of Selma, but we also remember the fact that there's no place else to walk anymore, and we're walking backwards now. The very people that we walked for in the 60s and before that, those people have already gone home to God. But we still have people walking the streets with us that are not thinking about giving us the right to vote, but are thinking of ways to get around our rights. And what we have to do now is prepare ourselves for being good citizens by fighting for our right to vote. Now, Martin would probably tell me to soften up on the fight, but somehow we've got to find a way to convince others that we have rights also. And it's up to us to teach our children But do you know within this past year, I was called upon by one of the local high schools to please come and see what's going on in our school. And I'm saying, but honey, I'm not involved in teaching. But I knew that there was something bigger than just talking about an education. The important thing was that those children had run out of people to ask for assistance when the schools were suddenly in the county where white flight had taken so much from our schools in the city. And the children and their parents were out looking for schools that would prepare them for entrance into universities that they could get into. Now, there's something wrong with that picture when the parents have to go out in the streets and we sit here and we talk about what used to be. Well, this is a now situation. And when I ask the children, because I had to go, I mean, you know, it's one of those things where the children are recognizing there's something wrong with the picture, but would you come and talk to us about it? I'm not in education. My entrance into my religious order had to do with health services. And I don't hold anything against us for being in health services, but we've got these young people that are saying, we can't find anybody who will tell us what's the right and what's the wrong about this picture. And so we sit here and we talk about those kind of things that used to be. The now is now, and these young people need somebody to take an undivided attention to what they are saying. And one young man that was in the group wanted to know 
why he couldn't use the N-word, have mercy, why he couldn't use the N-word in a loving fashion. I said, honey, because you haven't heard that word used about yourself in a non-loving position. We need to, to teach the kids because they're looking for somebody to teach them. And if the older people, and my question was, well, why don't you talk to your grandmother and your mother and, and your daddy and what happened in the 60s and the 50s and the 40s? Where were they and what were they doing? And what was their point? And have they been converted to uh, really be concerned about the children? I, I, I don't think I'm answering anybody's question. So while I was saying purpose, she pointed to me and showed me on paper that she has an acronym for purpose that I want you all to hear. (laughs) You might not agree with all of these, but you can make up your own. P is for prayer. Every day, each day, spend some time in trying to know the way that God would lead you. U is for unity, walking hand in hand with somebody else who needs a helping hand from you. Reconciliation, I'm sorry, is not enough. Language and judgmental attitude takes away from I'm sorry. Peace, lift every voice and sing. Do we really sing that song when we say lift every voice and sing? Sing, oil, the bomb in Gilead, knowing that there is a bomb for each of us and that we can be a bomb with others, that we can lead others and, and take them on the walk that we have taken. That S is for sign, that we are a sign of silence, even our silence when we come to the time that we... Romans 8, 28 uh, speaks of purpose. For those who love the Lord, all things work together for good according to God's purpose. What is God asking of you? And we've already thrown God out of our schools. So... If we have our door open and our hearts open to our children, they can get God at home. Nobody keeps you from having God in your home. Uh, E, we are Easter people. First comes, first belongs to Good Friday before Easter comes. Be not afraid. Stir into flame. Paul said to Timothy, Stir into flame that fire that was introduced into your heart by the Holy Spirit. And at this point, as the pastor comes forward, I want to try one more thing, and I might get totally shot down, but I'm going to try it anyway. Um, Sister Ebo and... Sister Frankie, song has been such an important part of movements. And I know for a fact that Sister Ebo, when she gets wound up, she does two things. She says, have mercy, and she busts into song. I'm wondering if there's a particular song that's on your heart tonight that can help us to center ourselves as we close that you wouldn't mind singing. I'll even throw my little voice in. I'm going to say what the Spirit says, say. Say what the Spirit says, say. And what the Spirit says, say. I'm going to say, oh, Lord. Say what the Spirit says, say. I'm going to shout when the Spirit says, shout. I'm going to shout when the Spirit says, shout. And when the Spirit says, shout. I'm going to shout, O oh Lord, shout when the Spirit says sound. I don't know what else, I don't know what else to sing. Thank you.
Alive and Well celebrates our history, embraces our present, and is hopeful for the bright future. Made on behalf of these phenomenal women, committed to make a difference for all of us. You can listen to this program in its entirety by visiting aliveandwellstl.com. Listen for part two with civil rights attorney Frankie Muse Freeman. We'll see you next week. Alive and well, STL. We are grateful for your gift of time to this conversation. We encourage you to stay involved and get involved. If you, your family, or your organization is interested in talking about how we better the well-being of the region, sign up for more information, join the conversation, log on to AliveAndWellSTL.com, and let's build a plan on how we can work together and improve our overall health and become Alive and Well. The Regional Health Commission with Chief Executive Officer Robert Friend, Jr., committed to providing a detailed review of change over the past decade in 14 leading health indicators for the city and county of St. Louis. The first decade review of health status report, an update to building a healthier St. Louis. Discover the narrative, the data, and celebrate the progress already made to improve health care access and reduce health disparities in our region. Learn more at stlrhc.org. Alive and Well STL is another positive production of Rare Gym Productions. Thanks for listening.